Good afternoon. This is Conscious TV, and my name is Chris Hebbard. Today we have Mr. Greg Good with us, Dr. Greg Good, actually, who is a doctor of philosophy, having taken his degree at the University of Rochester in New York. Um, he is a philosophical consultant, uh, is how he calls himself, and, a, and the author of two fine books, a current one which is just out on Non-Duality Press, called Standing as Awareness. He also has another book which is available on his website called Non-Dualism in Western Philosophy. And uh, his website, for those of you who may be interested in taking a quick peek, and I'm sure you will be after this interview, is www.heartofnow.com. That's H-E-A-R-T, heartofnow.com. Greg is probably best known for his step-by-step -step commentaries on the, on the work of one of the three great sages of India, Sri Atmananda Krishna Menon. He's sort of the unknown titan of Indian uh, lore, uh, certainly an equal by every stretch of the imagination with Ramana Maharshi and Nisargadatta Maharaj. He has done commentary work on that, and he's done some film work recently with me on that. This is our first chance, really, to be able to, uh, to talk with Greg, who's a very interesting guy. It's always been my position, Greg, that truth, to be truth, has to be absolute. Truth is truth. It can't change. Mm -hmm. And so if we look at truth across, if that's the case, if it's true, it should be that across all traditions, mm -hmm. the same conclusion should be found. Mm -hmm. There shouldn't be a huge amount of disparity as we go across all the various traditions of Christianity and Hinduism and Buddhism and Sufism and you know um, so forth and so on that if it is actually absolutely true that it should be true in each of those traditions so there might be very many different paths to the oasis we'll call it okay but that essentially the same oasis is found one of the things that I find most interesting about you is that through your academic career and through your personal interests mm -hmm. that there's this chain of Western philosophers uh, Western mystics, Eastern mystics, a really great basket of them that you've managed to be able to call out the basic truths from. Mm -hmm. Starting with, uh, I'd like to talk about a guy by the name of Brand Blanchard, mm -hmm. who I think sort of started you on this path. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. I used to be a fan of Ayn Rand, the author of Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged. <clears throat> and I found out that she got some of her best ideas from Brand Blanchard. She says Aristotle, but she was thinking a lot, Brand Blanchard. And he was an idealist early in his career, and it was living with Brand Blanchard's book called The Nature of Thought for probably two or three years that showed me that there's really nothing substantial to things, to objects, physical objects, subtle objects. They were nothing but qualities. So the quality of hardness of something doesn't seem hard if it's not part of a physical object. A physical object would be hardness and redness and a certain shape, like a circuit. Say, think of a tomato. Round, soft, red, and those are um, qualities, characteristics, attributes. attributes without a substance. So there's you know the classical duality between substance and attributes. He just showed you there's no substance, that all it is is attributes. So it would be that shade of red, that particular size. They're, he called them concrete universals. And he did a great job of arguing away the substance that one might think underlies these things. Mm -hmm. So the whole world was transformed for me into something very subtle. It wasn't something like Barclayan idealism. It was just subtle universals. And it's such a neutral term that it took away all the seeming solidity and hardness and mm -hmm. um, intimidation of objects. Well, the material world does seem intimidating and real. So from that point of Brand Blanchard, without spending too much time on any of these, I just wanted to sort of touch on some of this stuff. You then went through a Western Christian, very mm -hmm. fundamental, almost fundamentalist tradition mm -hmm. for a while. And what did you get out of that? That was actually a spiritual... And emo that was an opening of the heart for me. Mm -hmm. it, was hap it happened when I was in graduate school, and graduate school is a very lonely place. Mm -hmm. um, you, you're not taken care of and coddled like you are in the undergraduate world, and you're not yet an adult either. Mm -hmm. So we used to say it's 
Better than a paper clip, but not as good as a staple. <laughs> so you're in a, like a, you know, no person's land, a demilitarized zone. So I was very lonely. And I was working, um, while I was getting my degree, I was working on my dissertation. I was always also working in, a, in one of the administrative offices. Mm -hmm. And I had a secretary. She invited me to church with her. Mm -hmm and was to uh, gospel singing. Mm -hmm. That's what she called us, singing. We're going to a singing. <laughs> so I went, and I felt such incredible joy and lightness. I said, I want more. So I went to a couple more, and what happened, is one particular one, where they were singing something from John 3.16, For God So Loved the World, a, like a bursting open of the heart. It just burst into everything, and I... I was not a very nice person at that time, um, but I wanted to go around and say I was sorry to everybody. My heart was open. I just loved everybody. Mm -hmm. I stopped swearing. Um, I stopped listening to certain kinds of music and adopt. I just wanted to hear gospel. I wanted to hear more about this. I started going to church. I became a deacon. It was the Holy Roller Church, too, Pentecostal. You know, it was, you know, the kind of thing that people make fun of these days. Yeah. You know, Right-wing yeah. Christian fundamentalists. Yeah. And I had so a great that's time. What's so vibrant about this story, okay? Because if, you, if the audience can walk along with us, we've just now talked about idealism. And you may be saying, as you're sitting here, what does this have to do with Advaita? What does this have to do with non-dualism? Well, this has a tremendous amount to do with the process of inquiry that we go through as we come to the truth. And two of those things have to do with sort of an idealist conclusion about the nature of the universe, but also the whole presentation in terms more familiar to our audience of bhakti, of love, of devotion, mm -hmm. of heart coming mm -hmm. out. So then we go from that and now we start going into your, one of your theses I think was on by George Berkeley, Bishop Berkeley, mm -hmm. another uh, from the Church of England, I was a bishop with the Church of England, and he did a really terrific uh, work. Mm -hmm. and, and I know that you wrote a paper on it, I know your teacher was one of the reading th leading thinkers on that thing. And I'd like you to share with our audience how that ties into this whole on mm -hmm. thing. Well, I'll tell you first how it ties in. I'll tell you the details about his and how I got so mm -hmm. like wrapped up in it. So far, these things serve to uh, take the bite out of this seeming thinghood, seeming seemingly independent, hard, external mm -hmm. realities, yep. solid, mm -hmm. impenetrable, and separate from me. Mm -hmm. It softened that. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, seeing them as, as like concrete universals, that strange whatever that stuff is, made it seem like they were not a thing. So it broke one thing into many soft things. Barclay made it seem like those were ideas, and ideas were soft and wonderful and subtle, and um, they, they play like light. So it's not that they're telling the truth about things, it's that they're pointing against falsity. Right. It's a netty netty, a, a Western netty netty. netty netty. Yeah, yeah. And there's enough in Western philosophy for any particular kink a person has. And of course, for you know, the kinks are themselves Western. Mm -hmm. So the solutions can be Western as well. <laughs> so, um, for those of those uh, who might like to play catch up ball with George Berkeley, would you recommend one of his books in particular? Yes, three dialogues between Hylas and Philonous, right. and it's a. Uh, he wrote it a little bit later than he wrote his main works on idealism. And it was actually a, um, an answer to frequently asked questions that Barclay himself got. So he had a chance to add you know, a couple new viewpoints, and he wrote it in the form of a dialogue. And one thing about Barclay is he's one of the most accessible writers in the Western philosophical tradition. Well, that's nice, because accessible and philosophy usually don't go together. <laughs> and I recently had the chance to demonstrate that to someone. Said, they said, oh, Barclay's really hard to read. But I was in a, a grad, graduate seminar for Barclay. What's great about uh, that seminar was that my teacher, Colin Murray Turbain, was himself a great Barclayan. Mm -hmm. um, he, was, he really thought this was it, and he wanted his students to think so, too. He had tenure. He was almost emeritus. Mm -hmm. So he didn't have to worry about being called, you know, like, um, he didn't have to worry about leading the witness and leading the, you know, the students and mm -hmm. stuff. He, he didn't work. doesn't matter. This is it. Mm -hmm. So he told us, if you want a good grade in this class, <laughs> you know, Barclay is right and his critics are wrong. So if you want a good grade in this class, you better write pro Barclay. <laughs> if you write against Barclay, your paper has to be even better. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise I won't be convinced. Mm -hmm. So we had to study Barclay very, very, very hard. And I remember 
one day that like the penny dropped, I said, oh, I get it. I know what he's saying now. It makes perfect sense. And I had this gleam in my eye. And I ran into Professor Turain's office and said, I know what he's talking about. And he said, good. Now go tell others. <laughs> Isn't that ironic? Yeah. It's sort of what you're doing now. So in any case, uh, without belaboring the point and probably butchering Barclay, I would say uh, for our, our viewers, and correct me if I'm wrong, that a lot of what Barclay was trying to uh, teach us was that our external sense perceptions are the only thing that we ever really experience. We never experience the object in itself. We, ex we experience the sense perceptions mm -hmm. of those objects, and those perceptions are actually nothing more than ideas in the mind. It's pretty good. It's like 87 percent yeah. right. Well, oh. consider considering I haven't done much studying of them. Um, yeah. He said that the object, like the, the tomato, would be just <clears throat> a word we give a collection of these um, these ideas. He said they were all ideas. Mm -hmm. So the ideas don't represent a tomato. Mm -hmm. They're not caused by a tomato. Mm -hmm. They are the tomato. Right. And they're not external because there's no, um, everything is an idea other than a mind. So they're a multiplicity of minds and the source of ideas come from God's mind. Now not everybody goes along with that part. <laughs> and I didn't quite either. But I got the deconstructive part, the critical right. part. Right. And this is the point I'm trying to make without spending a whole lot of time on any of these, is that this deconstruction is part of the self-inquiry process that a lot of people mm -hmm. have been to. And there's a reason why I'm going down this road, mm -hmm. and a reason why I think that you, yep. are, you, you are very helpful to, 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 to people right now. And these are the component parts of it. So from Barclay and coming through and doing your graduate work and doing all that, you then got into Western mysticism for a while. That was an outgrowth of Christianity. Mm -hmm. I was um, kind of scared of the Eastern tradition. I didn't mm -hmm. understand it. I didn't know very much about it. And of course, in the church, it was pretty much frowned upon. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I was taking a step outside of orthodoxy, even looking at anything other than their own te other than the Bible, really. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I had a friend who was um, a fellow cyclist, and he said, "You like philosophy? Yes. Then read um, Steiner, Rudolf mm -hmm. Steiner." Mm -hmm. And so I did, and that turn me on to lots and lots. Once you get one, mm -hmm. then you can read the others. Yeah. You know? Then mm -hmm. he had references and you follow the, you know, you follow the, the index and stuff like that mm -hmm. and the people he refers to and that opened up the world of um, Western mysticism for me, which further softened the concepts that I was taking literally from Christianity. Right, right. He, the first thing my friend Another said, softening. God is within you. Mm -hmm. And I thought, and he, my friend seems so convinced. Blasphemy. It was at the time. <laughs> and I thought, you know, and I looked into it yeah. and it softened up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then from Western mysticism into Eastern mysticism. Yes, because a, a couple of my, a couple of um, the writers that I was very much interested in, you know, studied um, uh, anthroposophy, that was Steiner, mm -hmm. and then um, theosophy. Mm -hmm. And I found they were cribbing. They've got those particular guys cribbing. got their best ideas from Stole Buddhism, it. from Hinduism. <laughs> yeah, they were cribbing. <laughs> So, in the interest of trying to share with some of, of, of our viewers, I just wanted to try to talk for a bit and to ask you, what are, you feel, are some of the recurring themes, we'll call them, mm -hmm. that come up, the common misconceptions and stuff like that that you end up working with, with people, mm -hmm. you know, um, that, that you see in the marketplace today? Since we're talking about this variety of traditions, the first thing that comes to mind is a sense of confusion that people have because of studying a variety of traditions. And they think that um, they have trouble, they, they have an assumption that all the traditions should point in the same direction in the same way. So sometimes the, the vocabulary items don't match up, you know, emptiness versus consciousness, or love versus knowledge, right. or something like that. Right. Or what one teacher says versus another teacher. Awareness versus consciousness. We Awareness versus consciousness yeah. is a good one. Yeah, we just were talking about that. And that's even within a narrow tradition, but sometimes mm -hmm. they would come from Buddhism or Western mm -hmm. monotheistic mm -hmm. traditions or science or yeah. just philosophy. And they don't know how to understand the thing. That they think that their first job is to reconcile differences between teachings. Right. And so it could go either way. I could show them how to reconcile or tell them that reconciliation is not necessary. 
you know, go deep, don't go wide. <laughs> you know. yeah. Yeah. Another one is um, thinking, wanting enlightenment in order to gain a new possession. Ah, this is the realization is going to make me special. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's oftentimes, um, most of the time, a misunderstanding of awareness or enlightenment mm -hmm. or having imbibed a desire to become like a teacher of theirs. I want to take on personal phenomenal characteristics that resemble that person. Mm -hmm. And I'd, that's my criterion of success. I'm not done until that's the case. I have one friend whose ideal was Tibetan, and he's German. <laughs> so that, it was doomed to failure from the get-go. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, some other common misconceptions. The big one, the biggest, the number one mm -hmm. misconception is being seduced by what I call the Cartesian theater model, or the container metaphor, mm. or as Gilbert Ryle once said, the ghost in the machine. That's great. And I think we should spend a little time on that one because this is one that was particularly helpful to me, mm -hmm. which is the whole idea that the absence of boundaries is something that really needs to be looked at. As we go do our self-inquiry, we start to realize mm -hmm. that awareness of what I am or consciousness has no boundaries. Mm -hmm. But what does that really mean? Yeah, I must say that you had expressed that misunderstanding with more panache and more confidence than I'd heard anyone else. <laughs> <laughs> you made it almost sound true, you know? <laughs> um, the notion is that we're a, non, we're a spiritual or a non-material substance of some sort enclosed in a material container. And that our field of sentience, like the field of vision, the field of hearing, are themselves containers, containers of what is observed. And whenever you have a container, you have an outside of the container. So that sets up a, a very, um, a, a form of separation that is the root of suffering. That if I'm in here and I feel that that's out there, I feel vulnerable, I feel limited, I can feel alienated. Even if it's not a matter of danger, I can still feel alienated from reality. Right. Most of our viewers uh, today will not relate to what you call the Cartesian model, but to say that we're starting to gnaw on the bone at the root of the idea of feeling of separation. What mm -hmm. causes the actual feeling of separation in, in, in this conversation? Right. I think they'll get it real quick here. Right. Okay? right. But what I found fascinating is something much more fundamental, mm -hmm. which is how those boundaries are still operating in the subtle world. Mm -hmm. Well, the witness of the body is not the body, so there's, that's, there's clarity on that, but it seems like the witness is still inside something. And if it's inside something, maybe it's inside a subtle container of some sort. You know, you wouldn't think that the witness is inside a cranium made of bone, but if it feels like it's inside of something, then it leaves a possibility that there's another such container with another such sentience somewhere else and there's a separation there. So there's a separation from inside, outside, and one to another. Right. And there's a separation of the way I want it to be and the way it is. Right. These are all examples of different kinds of separation. That, uh, this whole idea of that what I am might even be a personal sense of awareness. Mm-hmm. Okay? Yeah. That somehow, and when you really start to dig into that, you say, okay, I'm a personal sense of awareness. Let's see if we can figure out where the boundaries are. Mm -hmm. Even when doing an inspection of bodily sensations, where does my awareness end and where does the sensation begin? Right. You know, and where, why is it that the sound of the fan going on in the background over here and the itch in my lip, are they really appearing in two different places? Am I receiving that information in two different places right. or is it all happening at zero distance from me? Right. If you look at if you ask yourself where a thought arises, that's maybe easier to see because you don't think of a thought as mm -hmm. something um, physical in the first place. Right. So the place a sound arises is the same place a thought arises. Well, so this is beautiful, but to get people to even to that point of investigating that what they're experiencing is not objects, mm -hmm. but essentially their, their sensory perception of the object, and that when they say they're experiencing a chair here, they're experiencing something First, it has tactile feeling. It feels sort of smooth on the top. It feels very solid. Um, 
it, it might have a sound okay, associated with it, so there's hearing involved in it. I could see it. It seems very solid. It's black, and et cetera, and so forth. But everything, like you were tr trying to allude to before, I'm trying to bring this so that someone can understand what you're actually trying to say. These are all descriptions. These are attributes. These are things that I'm, sensory perceptions that I'm perceiving. And where are those perceptions going on? Is the perception going on here, or is it going on in mind? Well, you could start with, um, let's say, pain. Mm -hmm. um, that's the way that George Barclay starts with the feeling of burning pain. Mm -hmm. So let's say that there's burning, let's say there's a fire here, or this kind of pain. Is the pain here? Right. You wouldn't want to no. say that. It, it seems no. very clear that the pain is not here. Right. Well, every characteristic's like that. Yeah. The pain is not there. Right. So, is the color there? Well, where is, the, where is color experienced? That's the question. Now, in the experience of a color, a color comes up, a color arises, and it rises in a very gentle, open way, if you see a color. Does the color announce where it comes from? Does the color announce like, where it is the location of a color communicated by the color? No, not by mm -hmm. the color in itself. Now, yeah. you gotta, you got to stop here for a second for our <coughs> viewers because what you're doing is you're stripping away strictly the data of color from the superimpositions that mm -hmm. come along with it. Right. When you say color, yeah, sure, it says color's right here. Right. Okay, that's a superimposition. We're just talking about the sight, the visual sight of color. The seeing. Right, the, the seeing. seeing of the color. Mm -hmm. So the seeing of the color doesn't arise in the color. It right. doesn't arise outside, and it doesn't arise at any distance from here. There's no border that you can see. There's no gap that you can see when it arises. Mm -hmm. It's right here. There's no way to put it somewhere else. There's no way. It, it doesn't announce a destination. Or it doesn't announce a, a source or a location. It's just present. And when you look into it, it's even presence. It's not the presence of an object like a a cat in your living room that could also be in the kitchen. Right. It's just simple presence, close, global presence. Right. Just the visual, just the, just the seeing. Right. And then the seeing, that's, that's the color seen, supposedly. It's not really seen, but it's, the color is inseparable from seeing. Even in imagination, yeah. you can't imagine a color that doesn't have seeing connected with it somehow. Of course. The color is not distant from the seeing, and the seeing is not distant from the witnessing of the seeing or the knowledge of the seeing. Right. I call that the, the implosion or the telescoping inwards, that there's inseparability all the way back. And it's not, I'm not, I shouldn't even be pointing to a body because mm -hmm. there's well, no directionality. Well, you've got to start someplace, and you're, you're, you are pointing to the body. If, if what I am is awareness, and what I am is not an object, how is it possible that something which is not an object fits inside something that is an object? How can something that's non-physical mm -hmm. be inside something that's physical? Mm -hmm. Okay, It's an impossibility. Well, I think, like you said, it's, it's okay to... We, we don't attack all containers at once. Right. Know? No, but the point we, is... We attack we don't the, have a... the outermost ones, or the most tangible ones, yeah, first. Right. And then, and, and it, because they're the ones on the outer edges. Right. And also, they're kind of easy to see. And then it gives you some momentum. You get some confidence yeah. going, too. You yeah. say, ah, because yeah. it's the same insight goes all the way. Yeah. And so it's much harder to see, like, the body as a physical object. You know, that's why you start with stuff like chairs. Yeah. right. And then the same insight pertains to anything that has color, shape, or tangibility. So this exercise, though, so that people know, because we don't really um, have the benefit of enough time to go through yep. the whole analysis right, right now, do doesn't start and end with seeing. We also go through hearing. We also go through feeling. Right. We also maybe even go through smelling and yes. maybe even tasting. Yes. But we go through the exercise of doing that with each of the sensory perceptions until mm -hmm. we've established and we have confidence of the fact mm -hmm. that those are experienced as perceptions. Right. And that those right. perceptions are not the object. And different people have certain senses are stickier, that, you know, for some people than for other people. Some right. people it's seeing, 
for many people, most people, it's touching, which is the, the hardest one to see as just presence right. and awareness. Right. It's harder to, to, to telescope inwards. Well, but even kinesthesia, a, even movement is like that. Mm -hmm. any, any proprioception, anything is like that. Proprioception? Just, yeah, the, uh, who yeah. do you think your audience is? What is proprioception? <laughs> what does it mean? <laughs> this is not a PhD class, Greg. Come on. Like the sense of movement, <laughs> the sense of... <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, I'm sorry. Anything. <laughs> movement. Like one of the, um, Douglas Harding has an uh, exercise that I like. It it's, tells you the same thing. Imagine yourself, he says, in a, sitting in a train. I like to say moving in a chair. Imagine, you can do this at home. Sit in a chair with wheels in the bottom, like these casters, you know, mm -hmm. in a place where you have some room oh, to, love to, do that. to roll around. Yeah, and push sit, off. Sit like this. Mm -hmm. Still, you know, pretty much like rivet yourself to the chair and then have someone else move the chair sideways. And you look at the wall in front of you, like that, mm -hmm. and see what happens with your visual evidence. This is something we never did when on all our conversations about mm -hmm. with movement, yeah. but it works with movement too. Do you have evidence of yourself moving? No. If you look at the visual evidence, right. what comes? What moves? Right. If anything it looks moves, like it what looks moves? like the walls moving actually. Right. Mm -hmm. But there's absolutely no evidence, no <laughs> visual evidence at all that you mm -hmm. are moving. Mm -hmm. So that is a, a way to understand that you, as awareness, don't go anywhere, don't do anything. Well, we're just starting to scratch the surface of this. This is just such a rich vein mm -hmm. here, and it, it, it's a huge breakthrough. I can't stress to people how if you work your way through this stuff, that a lot of things that we've been talking about for a long time in non-dualism become very real very quickly. Mm -hmm. Because now it's no longer a, a, an intellectual understanding. It right. is the truth of your experience. Right. And it's an unshakable, irreversible truth. Right. It never goes, it never goes back. So it's, it's Alice in the rabbit hole is what you're yeah. saying. Is yeah. Be careful before you call him because you'll be putting your foot down the rabbit hole. And once you fall down, there's no coming back. And the world is, is ever so much more glorious, open, loving. <laughs> <laughs> He's selling tickets to the <laughs> rabbit hole now. So, but in any case, so we get into this whole thing, uh, th this analysis, and I agree with you. I absolutely agree with you that the place you want to start is with physical reality, the, what we call external reality out mm -hmm. here. And once you've sort of gotten confident about that, you can start questioning about what are you talking about external mm -hmm. reality. We have another container. Right. And you can talk about, okay, we're talking in subtle. Now we understand it's all perception and mind. Okay, and now we can talk about mind and what you know. What what is that container, you know? Right. And what's right. the evidence that consciousness is contained within the body? Right, right. Okay. Because the body can be investigated along the very very same lines as that. Right. The body is not the the corridor or the it's the communicator oh. of sensations. Yeah. It is itself sensed. If you think about it, just one step further, a perception can't see a perception. Right. And a perception can't carry a perception. So if the body is a perception, it can't serve as a conduit or pipeline of perceptions. Because a perception itself doesn't do anything more than that which it's perceived to do. And it does a lot less. So you, you don't see the body carrying perceptions across you know, little, little tubes or pipes like that. It's just an inert sense, just like the arising of color, the arising of a sense of texture, a pain. Mm -hmm. You don't see a body, you don't feel a body here, you don't s f feel a body doing this. The right. doing this itself is an intellectual conclusion. Right. You know, and we've heard for many, many, many years through, you know, centuries that this is how the body works. Right. So it takes a little bit of time to crack it. Yeah. Well, it's just, I can't tell you how absolutely uh, both destabilizing but also liberating it is once you walk through this process, and we haven't even gotten into the more subtle containers that you and I have talked about, because right. really, we're, I, I want to at least touch on a couple of the other common misconceptions, but I'm just trying to give our audience here a feel for some of the areas that caught, at least caught me up sure. in, the, in, in this investigation that you were helpful with. Um, there is um, another common misconception, which is that there's nothing to do. Mm. And I think you probably have some people that are coming to you because they're sort of on an intuitive level wondering, 
you know, what is that all about? Is that really where we're at? Yeah. Well, there's a certain non-dual discourse that says that makes that a main pinnacle of the teaching that there's nothing to do. And then that sets up a little bit of discrepancy with people because most of the rest of the things they've heard in their whole life say that there's lots of stuff to do and you should do it. So a lot of times when they come to me, they're talking as though there's a telephone, there's a computer, and there's a Greg, and there's a them, and everything's in place. <laughs> That's their assumption about things. And the one thing that they have a question about is if there's something to do or not. Yet they're not questioning everything across the board. It's just that one issue. So they have a world, they have a person, they have a person they're talking to, and everything else. It's a world without, it's a world totally in place, but without this one element called doership. Right. And this is a global investigation. Right. Everything ends up being sort of equally consciousness. Mm -hmm. There's no privileged, like, can opener kind of one notion that topples all the rest. It's mm -hmm. different for different people. Mm -hmm. So if a person believes in a world and a you and a me, right. then the I think it's a wonderful thing to use the notion of doership. Right. That's how they can do stuff that they right. think will help them. Right. And they're going to start th understanding this stuff as beneficial for themselves right. until that also starts dissolving. Right. I mean, the great, the great advice that was given to me is if you still believe yourself to be a separate person, then by all means, do the work of investigating mm -hmm. whether or not you're a separate person. And there's many, many, and a lot of times they have uh, other, when they have this particular question, it's something they've heard, and it's almost a uh, non-dual cliche these days. In it fact, is. so much so that I think it's actually lost some of the power that yeah. it might have had several mm -hmm. years ago, mm -hmm. because people are finding out they've actually turned to these other things. Some people yeah. go to yoga. There's, yeah. there's a, because it didn't work. It didn't work. Yeah, it's because it didn't work. So one of the things they want to do, they're also attracted to other traditions that they have had contact with, that they felt like a sense of non-dual guilt. Right. They shouldn't do this, or else they'd be losing non-dual points for it. And so a lot of what I do is say, it's okay. You know, one of the scariest things to me of all is that we approach non-duality as a deconstruction of our personalities and identification and somehow this brilliant thing called ignorance creates a new identity. It's the mm -hmm. non-doer identity or it's the spiritual mm -hmm. identity or it's mm -hmm. the, you know, and all we've done is we've replaced one set of ident identifications as a separate something into a whole new one. Mm -hmm. um, another one uh, of the common misconceptions that uh, it seems to be coming out of Vogue as well, talking about doership, um, is the one um, that thinking is your enemy. Mm -hmm. Okay, that was a very uh, big issue. Um, and I guess you've had some experience with people coming to you saying, you know, is it really important that I shut my mind up before I can really investigate this stuff and what's going on? This, you know, mm -hmm. is, is my thinking an indication that I'm not making progress? Or? Right. And some people have the goal. It's very extreme sometimes. And that's also something you don't hear as much these days. It was Certain teachers who were in vogue, maybe in teachings, were in vogue 10 or 15 years ago, had this more. You don't hear it that much anymore. And that left people with the feeling that they're supposed to be totally thoughtless. Mm -hmm. A person, a mind, it's okay to have senses, you know, like sensory mm -hmm. input, but mm -hmm. no thoughts. Thoughts are the enemy, but mm -hmm. other things aren't. And um, that actually takes away one of the greatest tools you can have is thinking. He's th thinking is the greatest tool of all for deconstructing thinking. It does. And it doesn't have to leave anything dangling at the end in the background. You know, right. the Buddha's great, the great image of you have a thorn in your flesh, you pick it out with another thorn, mm -hmm. and throw them both away. Right. They're tools. They're tools. Okay. I, um, I've, I've just touched upon a few of the, the many things I'm sure that you've heard from from students and, 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 and confidentially from teachers, different kinds of things that have come up uh, on your list. I'd like to share with the audience that there is a, a new book out that uh, Greg has just written called Standing as Awareness. And a lot of these issues are addressed in that book. Mm -hmm. um, and some of it, uh, Standing as Awareness is actually a term from Atmananda Krishnamenon, who is, as, as uh, Greg and I are very fond of, of saying, is probably next, along with Ramana Maharshi and Nisargadatta Maharaj, the third of the great titans, and is much less well known. And some of his work is uh, 
is really valuable. Uh, so you could pick this book up, and mm -hmm. the other thing they can do, obviously, is, is they can drop you a line, or they can go to visit you on the website at mm -hmm. Heart of Now. Mm -hmm. right? I love talking about this. It's one of my favorite things in life. Well, you see, this is what the great thing is. You know, oh. we, we do it because it's our passion to do it. Mm -hmm. if, 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 if someone said to you, look, you can do anything you want to do tomorrow, you don't have to do this anymore. What would you be doing? This. <laughs> That's what we'd be doing anyway. No. That's the point. <laughs> so we get to do what we love to yeah, do. Yeah, right. <laughs> so in any case, thanks an awful lot from Conscious TV. Okay. Namaste to all of you.